Yeah. Okay. Now, now the problems that Yankee barns have are, are really uh, specific, partly um, specifically with foundation to whether they're ground level or whether they're full basement. Okay. Now, um, and, and the important thing to remember about a ground level Yankee barn is that when it comes to the foundation, and, and this is true of all timber frames, is the most important part is where the load bearing points are, and those are under where the posts are. Okay. So, so this is, this is a Yan ground level Yankee barn, Molten Farms, and you can see a, a sag in the roof there. And, and that's because the foundation, which is a, a, a dry laid fieldstone foundation, has started to fall away underneath one of those side posts and, and it's got a bend in it. Um, uh, and this barn is in, is in pretty sad shape. You know, siding looks bad. Roof is an old metal, metal roof. Um, if you flip to the next slide for me, Beverly. Okay, hold on. Uh-oh. No, don't. Don't say that. There you go. So, so the other problem you're going to have with a ground level barn, right, is that the floor a lot of time is close to the ground. Go back. Go back. There you go. So, so the floor is close to the ground, right? And, and, and so it rots pretty easily, right? And, and this is at the entranceway, so it, it obviously rots easier. Um, and and so that, um, you know, the floor will start giving out. And we can go to the next slide. And then due to the floor giving out, due to the foundation moving on the outside, we'll start getting joint failure up higher in the frame. So in this picture, you can see a knee brace. That's the diagonal piece there, um, where it's the tenon has pulled out of the mortise and the broken out piece is where the peg was through into the mortise. And you can see somebody's added a scab of wood onto the post there to try and keep it from spreading more, okay? Um, and the important thing when you're looking at a barn and you're deciding on the repair and, and whether you're gonna, so when you look at a barn um, and when I'm doing an evaluation of the barn, uh, the first thing I'm gonna do is look at the basement and look at the foundation but then I'm gonna set up a laser level that's gonna shoot a line in the barn. And I'm gonna measure down from a common joint, okay, in the barn timber frame. And that's gonna tell me what posts have dropped. Um, and, and I'm gonna look at the joinery too at the same time. And if the joinery is pulling apart and pulling apart bad enough where I'm concerned about the structural integrity of the timber frame, then that automatically says I'm gonna to have to pick up that barn to re-put it back together again. And, and so as I pick it up, I, I come, put come alongs on and I pull the joinery back together again and replace missing pieces. Um, but if the joinery is not pulled apart part, and the timber frame, you know, the foundation has failed a little bit, then I they have a choice. I can choose to stabilize the barn in the shape it's in, okay? And that's a lot less expensive than picking up a frame, leveling it off, plumbing it and putting it back, you know, uh, into the original shape it was in. Um, but, you know, it's the, it's, the, it's the damage to the frame that's gonna determine that. Um, and so we, when you see a barn like this, a lot of times you're gonna go and look in a barn where this joinery started to pull apart and you're gonna see cabling going from one side of the barn to the other. And you're gonna see iron, what we call dogs, they're kind of uh, horseshoe shaped long dogs that are put in uh, to try and hold the barn together. All those things are band-aids and they're not solving the, um, the problem of, of the foundation movement. We can go to the next slide, Bev. Okay, so here's the other thing that sort of determines the factor. Um, and so I should say there's, there's three things that kind of do the most damage to a barn. Okay, one is when the foundation moves. Okay, the two is when the, the second is when the roof is not taken care of. Um, and that's what's indicated in this picture here. And, and the third thing is, to be honest, what was how well the barn was built to begin with, and also what the farmers done to it over time to adjust the barn to more modern day farming. So what, 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 what is true about all these barns early on is they weren't built for, for animal um, of housing, they were built for fodder storage. 
And when uh, New Hampshire was originally settled, we raised sheep for the wool market. And, and most of these barns stored hay and they didn't have large dairy herds in them. And when New Hampshire, this was sort of in the 1830s, starting in the 1830s, the, you know, sheep farming started moving west. Um, then um, we started going more to dairy to provide uh, to the butter market in Boston. And we brought cows into these barns with wood flooring and, and cows and, and wood floors don't mix very well. Okay, and also the farmers adjusted, took out timbers here and there to uh, adjust for hay forks, traveling hay forks, um, and uh, to make room for stalls. So anyway, so this is a barn where you can see there's some rot. This is a gable end rot here. And what this is a picture of is what we call the English meeting joint, okay? And, and uh, you can see that the top tying timber is got some pretty serious rot in it, and that rot's probably going down to the corner post. Okay, so we can go to the next picture, Bev. And that's where you can see more rot. So you look at that in the upper left hand of that picture, you see um, white um, on the underside of the boards there. And that's an indicator of leakage coming down and, and, and causing more rot. And, and probably that uh, top plate of, of that um, side of the barn is not in good shape. And that's a picture of an English meeting joint that's in, in pretty decent shape. Um, but that's a complicated joint to fix when you have um, a bunch of members rotten in it. Now, one of the things to be aware of in, in, in a barn is that sometimes the roof can look pretty decent and can have some pretty serious problems. Um, but, and that's why you want to look for the white staining on the underside of the boards. Because if you see that white staining and you really want to explore um, up there, because the water tends to get in and then travel down those boards and travels into um, um, uh, drop-in uh, mortises for the uh, purlins um, and places like that and can rot out those main carrying rafters and you won't know it because they'll be rotten just in the pockets. Um, so we can go to the next picture, Bev. And, and there you see it even worse. So there you can see where the rot is really bad in those roof boards. You can see it's actually wet in that picture. You can see the rod has traveled down through into the mortise of the, uh, of the, um, of the knee brace there. And uh, that will, uh, you know, you had, that will be a pretty good repair right there. So one of the things to be aware of, so this is the barn, this is that first barn I showed you pictures of, and it had foundation problems, which we saw um, by the movement in the roof line there. And, and also we could see the stones had fallen out um, and the first floor was, was basically rotted away. But the roof's a major issue in this barn. But, you know, and people always ask me, can you phase the repair of the barn? Can, you know, and, and when the roof is this bad, you have to do something about the roof soon. But you can't permanently repair this roof until you repair the rest of the barn, okay? And, and, and the reason for that is, is that um, when you do something to the roof, if you have a roofer come in, let's say it's an asphalt roofer and they don't like the gaps between those roof boards and, and they want to put plywood over that and they put plywood over that, then it locks the barn in the shape it's in and no longer can you pick it up then and reconnect the joinery that has problems. So the, the repairs to the foundation on the first floor have, and then the timber frame have to come first in this situation. What I tell people is, if you, if you can't jump into the pond sort of in the restoration process and swim to the other side at this point, then, um, and this one has an old metal roof on it, then either fix that old metal roof or put a new screw on metal roof on this temporarily to keep any worse problems from happening. And then at least that roof can be taken off when funds are available for the actual full restoration. We can go to the next slide there, Bev. Okay, so this is a bank barn. Okay, this is the other style of Yankee barn. And, um, and bank barns um, have problems that are specific to them, but can be shared by the, the ground level barns in, as far as why the basement, why the dry laid foundation moves. But in this situation, um, in a bank barn, it's gonna be telegraph a lot worse into the upper frame. So, so the, the problem with a bank barn is, um, is poor, um, uh, poor drainage, okay? So, you know, if it's on a bank 
And in those days, you didn't, you know, you didn't put in drainage pipe. You could put in a French drain, but you didn't put in drainage pipe at the base of the foundation to take water away. Um, a lot of water comes off the roof. And usually a lot of times water's coming down the bank and it, it pools behind the dry laid foundation. And, and then in the wintertime, that water freezes, expands, and, uh, and starts pushing on the foundation. And so if in, in, a, in bank barns, you'll find either, you know, bows in the, in the dry laid foundation. Um, you'll find where the barn will, will start to migrate uh, down slope, you know, pushed by the movement of the foundation. And, and, um, and the solution to that is, is, is either rebuilding the foundation, putting in drainage. Well, that's, that's, and, um, and providing better drainage underneath the barn. Um, we can go to the next picture, Bev. So this is the underside of that, of that barn. And, and this is, um, you can see the foundation has some problems. You can't get a really good shot of it unless you're looking down the side of it. But then you can see the moisture in the basement of this barn. And so the water is really, really, there's a lot of water on that other side of that foundation. You know, it's pushing it, get freezing in the wintertime and pushing against it. You can see where the, uh, the water's coming through in the spring um, and, and, and pooling in the basement. You know, that causes problems with the posting in the basement and, and obviously posting and even in a, in a um, you know, the short supports in the inside of the interior of the, of the, uh, of the barn in a, in a ground level barn are, will suffer the same kind of problems. Um, but in a bank barn, it's going to, because it's higher off the ground, it's going to telegraph worse to the upper frame. So you can see where this barn, you know, you can see that this, it's had added posts in, it's had added timbers put in. And, um, and, and it really, in this case, you know, when you're putting the drainage in and fixing this barn, all that organic matter that you can see in that basement needs to get excavated out of there because that traps moisture and taken out and then that posting put on new footings. And, and those new footings can be stones. You know, once we take care of the drainage issue, then stone is, is a fine um, foundation uh, material for a timber frame barn. Because if the timber frame barn is kept in good shape and, the, and you have the drainage in there, one, the, the, the movement of the stone is gonna be minimal. And when you do have problems and you're taking care of the barn, you can just fix that fairly easily. Um, we can go to the next slide. All right, so there's a post where you can see in the, in the basement of that barn, and you can see it's just sinking into the ground. Um, the footing underneath it isn't even, isn't even there anymore. And, and so that, 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 you know, as that sinks into the ground, it's going to telegraph to the frame up above and start causing damage in the frame uh, above in the barn. You go to the next one, Bev. Okay, so this is uh, the floor in that, in that barn. And um, we can see two new joists there. We can see uh, where somebody's redone some of the posting and we can see some blocking on top of the post. And when you have a bank barn and it's um, had moisture in the basement for a good period of time, you know, it's gonna get issues up above due to dry rot, due to powder post beetle, but mostly it's gonna have issues due to at one time having cows in the barn, okay? And it's gonna rot um, the floor up above. And so when you're going to replace or you're gonna try and replace that posting, right? You have to be aware of the damage to the frame above your head. Because um, you, in order to replace that posting, you know, you have to put a temporary post on the side, pick up, support the floor, and then put in that new post. And you can do that when the timber frame is, has good solid integrity because you're gonna have mortises and tenons, tenons running into the uh, carrying beams underneath the posts. So you can pick up to the side and the, the mortise is gonna pick up that post and support it fine. But when you look, at, look above and you see blocking and you see um, problems up there, then you, you're at the point where you're gonna have to redo that floor system um, in order to uh, to do that. And so, you know, usually we, we cut out the floor system to put cribbing towers through the floor and add supports directly onto the, to the posting in the barn and support the barn that way and build a new floor system and put in new posting in the basement. You can, you can fix this by adding new timbering underneath, but it involves a lot of complicated um, uh, supporting 
and cribbing to make sure that everything is, is supported. Okay, Beth. And, and once again, here's another example of that. You know, you can see, you can see the way the tenon is popping out there. Um, and you can see, well, one, you can see whitewash up there um, and, and you know that cows are up there. And that's an instance where you, you really got to look above you and see what's happening before you try and move things around and look for looking how you're going to support the barn. And, and the other thing is you never, you never pick up um, by just a post and a jack. Um, in order to be safe, you, you have to build cribbing towers. And, you know, a cribbing tower is, is built with, you know, I, I use um, uh, timbers that are, that are six by eight. Um, and then you build a sort of like a Lego system. You build a tower um, that's four-sided, like a box. So the box will be four by four by the time you get up there and your jack goes at the top there. So you, you're, you're, you're protected and you don't have to worry about kick out. Um, I'm going to next picture, Beth. Okay, now this is looking down that foundation. Um, this is the uphill side of that barn. Um, and you can see the uh, movement in the, in the stones. Um, they're, they're being pushed out. Uh, there's a bulge in that wall. Um, this is also an example of actually a, a, a dry laid stone foundation that isn't built with very high quality stone. So there's a lot of round field stone in this, in this foundation which um, makes it much more difficult as far as um, building it and supporting, supporting the barn. Um, and when they built foundations in the days, you know, when this barn, was, this barn foundation was originally built, obviously they were doing it with oxen and stuff like that. They were going for height rather than um, building the uh, foundation more monolithically. Today we build a foundation where at the base of this foundation, you know, if you were going looking into the soil on the on the uphill side of that on the outside of that barn, that foundation would probably be seven or eight feet wide at the base, um, and then and then uh, batter up to the barn. And on the inside, it would be it would be uh, wider at the base than the than the sill up above, and it would batter up that way as well. So it would have it would have a it would have a um, you know a, not a lean is the wrong word, but by by batter I mean if you put a plumb bob up from the top. The top of the foundation would be, you know, six or seven inches in from the base of the foundation on the inside, and on the outside, like I said, would be seven feet wide. And and they also didn't use tie stones as much um, because they were going for height. Um, you can go to the next one. Okay, this is a barn in uh, it's Powder Major Barn, Maybury, and this is a ground level barn. And and this is so you can see in this barn where the obviously where the uh the load bearing points were because there's still some stone there right um but the rest of the foundation has has fallen away um in repairing this barn you've got a choice of either so there's a ground level barn so the choice is either building a full you know a uh, a sort of frost wall foundation the length of the barn or just supporting the ground the load bearing points you know, but you still put in, you still put in drainage and you still put uh, crushed stone um, underneath the stones. Um, so we would, in this case, in this case, you know, we would support the barn, take out the old foundation, dig a trench for drainage, you know, down below frost um, and, and build up our stone towers if it's for load bearing points or start the foundation at that point uh, with, a, with a drainage pipe at the base of, of that outside um, with uh, crushed stone around it and, and crushed stones to start laying the foundation on. And the reason we use crushed stone rather than like crushed bank one, which has sand in it, is crushed stone uh, is, has 99% compaction, just putting it in, into the hole. And that gives you a good start for leveling off your stones. Um, and then when, you're, when you put that pipe in, then you want to make sure you're sure you put a fabric above it to make sure that it doesn't get clogged. And then that runs out to daylight. Okay, Bev. Okay, here's, there's, this is an example of, of drainage going in. Um, uh, this is in Prescott Farm in Laconia. Um, you can see that drainage pipe going in, the crushed stone at the bottom. Um, you can see some of the old foundation still um, on that back, on that very end um, uh, to an attached barn. And, and you can see, um, if you look beyond uh, at, that, at that foundation, you can see how it was failing. Because if you look at the outside stones of that in the basement side of that 
um, you can see how far away they are, how much they've been pushed by the moisture, okay? So you can see the drainage going in the bottom, the crushed stone. You can see the cribbing towers um, that I'm talking about. And, and we're just about ready to start cribbing stones in this situation. Okay, Bev. Next slide, Bev. Are you there? I'm here. Um, there we go. Sorry. There you, go. you got it. Okay. That's good. So, so anyway, so that's landscape fabric. So that's going down. You can, you can see uh, uh, the pipe's been buried at this situation. Uh, the landscape fabric is going down to keep uh, dirt and fine materials from getting into that drainage pipe. Um, and then we'll start laying the stone foundation. So there's, there's a major project when you relay a dried stone foundation. So I want people to understand that this is sort of the big, big fix, because you can obviously go to concrete in these situations. And if you're going to go to concrete, um, then A, you want to make sure that one, the drainage is still going in there. Two, you, you can only pour a new concrete foundation, obviously up to a certain point because to get the concrete in there, and then you're gonna finish the, on the top of the ground of the concrete foundation to the barn with either granite sill stones or with, with cinder block. Um, but the important thing to remember when you replace a dry laid stone foundation in a barn, specifically in a big Yankee barn, is that it can't be an eight inch wall, okay? An eight inch wall, um, going down the length of a big barn will, will not survive. Um, it really needs to be, if you're going to do an eight inch wall, then you've got to do uh, supporting little support walls on the inside, um, or you've got to build a wider wall. Yeah, and, and I specifically would like to see a wider wall so that you can then, if you want to add uh, um, granite sill stones on top, that's better. Um, but don't, you know, if you build, I, I looked at a barn in Canterbury, where they put a concrete wall in, eight inch wall. Um, it was also in a situation where they didn't put the drainage in correctly and that wall is, is giving out. And that was in a restored barn. And it's kind of a shame that that's what happened. Next slide, Bev. Huh. Are we having well, technical difficulties? I think we are. Okay. There you go. You're, no, you're okay. So anyway, so, so that's, that's the stone starting to go in. Okay, and so you can see how wide the foundation is at the base, the dry laid foundation is at the base. And, and we put a lot of, of, of stones behind it. We put connector stones going over there. There should be no holes in a new dry laid stone foundation. They all get filled, but all, you don't just drop stones in, they have to be touching each other so that there's no, so that there, there's uh, no movement going down the road. Um, and you don't use round stone uh, to do those fillings. You want stone that's uh, got jagged edges and what like that. And then you, you actually, all those stones get placed. They don't get just kind of thrown into the hole. They get placed so that they're each are touching each other. They're touching on the bottom. And, and, and then you just fill in all the little spaces as you go up. And then the stone sort of bats, batters up from the outside to the end. Okay, Bev. Can you go back one? If you can't, no big deal. So, so then you're, there you see we're getting up higher. We're almost to the top of the foundation. You can see some tie stones in there. Um, and you can see how it batters up and, and you've got all the connector stones on the back. Next one, Bev. And that's the inside of that foundation uh, once it's finished. So it, once again, if you put a level on that and you, and you leveled up, the, uh, the top of the foundation is probably six or seven inches in from the base of the foundation because it's, so it's got a slight batter um, for um, you know, stability. Okay, Beth. Okay, so now let's talk about, that's looking, that's looking at the barn. So, uh, and that basement of the barn, the open basement end, but this, this slides here just to show you what I, what a okay posting fix is for a basement. Okay, so those are stones that those posts are sitting on underneath the queen posts, which are the posts on either side of the center aisle. Um, and that's fine because there's good drainage in there and there's good st uh, uh, crushed stone underneath those, you know, dug down and to lay those uh, granite blocks on. And the posting, um, I, you know, it's not sitting, the, the, the timber is not sitting directly on the stone. So, you know, you get those a, a day like, well, today's been a humid day. But you get a, in the springtime, you know, you get a cold 
um, uh, you know, you get a, or you get a warm day and then you get a cold night and, and moisture um, uh, collects on, on the stones because it's a, it's a colder surface, you know, uh, and, and it gets wicked up by those timbers. So in order to prevent that, um, I like to see either something, a uh, pressure treated piece or I add a piece of plastic wood to the base to protect the end grain of that new post so that you're not going to revisit those problems. I mean, the idea of a restoration is to get to the point where you're, 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 you know, you're not going to revisit the same problems down the road. I mean, there's no such thing as no maintenance, but you know, you want to minimize that maintenance going down the road. Okay. Um, and the, we're going to, now I'm going to, so that that's foundation. So now I'm going to start talking about um, timber frame. Okay. So this, this barn has some timber frame repair. It's got a whole new floor going in on the left hand side. That wasn't because that barn had a rotten, um, had a rotten floor on that side. It had an open uh, hay mow on that side. And in this situation, um, this was run by a school and they wanted to be able to run events in there. So we were adding a timber floor on that open hay mow side. Um, but on the, on the right hand side, you can see what we call a locking lap joint to accept a new timber. Now, when the timber frame needs repair up above, and a lot of times, you know, you're going to find specifically in those bank, uh, in those uh, um, uh, ground level barns, that you're going to have the bottom of the posts where you're going to have rot, the sills rotten, and you've got to do timber repairs. And you can't do timber repairs just by, because what, you, what your goal is to maintain the integrity and the strength of the timber frame foundation. So in that post where you can see new wood going up a little bit, it can't just be a straight cut there because that's not becoming an integral part of that post. So you have to do a lap joint there and it can't be a straight lap joint because you can bolt it, but that's not forever either. So we like to do what we call a locking lap joint. And that horizontal example there is an example of a, a lock, locking lap joint um, in that you can see there's a slight bevel on that top cut of the, and when, then it slides down and there's a bevel on that bottom cut so when the next piece goes on, it has to go on in a straight line and it maintains that straight line once it's pegged. So if the barn starts moving, that's gonna fight that movement in the timber frame up above, okay? You can go to the next picture, Beth. Now that's a bank barn in, in uh, New Hampton. Um, and uh, that slide is just showing a, a totally, so we're going back a little bit to foundation repair. That's showing a totally repaired, um, uh, Frost, frost wall, dry laid foundation, um, and ready for a new floor system to go in. That's a nice, that's a nice timber frame barn and, and, and a beautiful frame, in fact. And you can see in all that knee bracing and, and that top um, uh, timber running across the gable end is a single piece and they're single pieces on the top plate running the length of that barn. So there's a lot of structural integrity in that barn. And so you want to make sure you maintain that when you're doing the repairs to it, because that's what makes a barn survive the movement of a, of a dry, dry laid foundation. We go to the next picture, Beth. All right, here's, here's uh, an example of, uh, uh, this is the other problem that you'll find in a lot of barns. This is that powder major barn again. And this is the entranceway. So this is the gable end entrance. Um, and uh, it's an interior sliding door on that gable entrance. But even if it was, if it was a swing, you know, a door on pintle hinges, um, the gable end gets a lot of rot because um, rain comes in there and, and where that, where you're looking at the trim on, on, on that doorway, um, there's a queen post behind each end of that, you know, and there, originally there was a sill that connected across that doorway. But that sill, when you have an interior sliding door, that floor and that sill is always in the weather. So that sill tends to rot away and it rots away in, in, even when it's an outside barn, like I said. And the common repair to that um, was to pour a concrete threshold, okay? Now, usually the concrete threshold is just this, the rotten sill is taken out of there, a concrete threshold is poured, and it usually encapsulates the joists that are running down that center aisle of the barn, and they'll, they'll continue to rot, and you'll have a lot of problems in there. And so this is, this is a short-term solution to that, you know, because the farmer just wanted to keep farming. He didn't have time to really fix that. And, and everybody, I always repeat this myself, but there's two things they should have never shown farmers. And one was the invention of concrete and the other was the invention of the nail, you know, because um, they, they poured concrete to replace rotten timbers um, at entranceways and they added nails all over the place where it wasn't a good idea. 
you know, when you see, when you see a, a mud board um, or a trim board put on with 20 penny common nails, then you know there's rot behind there somewhere. Okay, we can go to the next picture, Beth. So there's the side, there's the side picture of that entranceway and you can see the concrete, but you can see the trim's rotten and, and um, the sill would have usually run right where that concrete was connecting across the gable end, connecting the two queen posts across the gable end. And, and um, the probably that bottom of that queen post is rotten there. So in, this, in these situations, we wanna remove that concrete, we wanna um, fix the sill and we wanna patch that queen post with the proper kind of joint. Go ahead, uh, Dev. All right. So here's an example of of a door of a of a uh, gable end, the center end, center center aisle entranceway being repaired. So this had concrete across the front end, and the concrete's been removed. Um, and what I like to do because I want I don't I don't want to revisit this problem. So I don't want a concrete sill there, but I want it. I want the joists to be connected into something, a new timber that's, and a new sill that's gonna connect back where it's gonna be out of the rain. So I add a stone threshold and then move my timber that my joist is going down the um, entranceway can drop into. And so when the door is closed of the barn, it's not gonna be in the weather anymore. Okay, Beth. So you can see in this situation, you can see the new silt, the new threshold in place. So that's a, a granite threshold. And you can see the ramp being built to, to bring yourself up there. So, so now the sill is there to connect across where those queen posts are on either side. And the timbering is out of the weather. Okay, Bev. And, and there you can see where the ramp is on the other side. Now the important thing to note in this picture is you want to have airspace, right? You don't want to have those the stone right tight to the sides or tight to the to the new timber in the back. You want to have airspace, and you want to make sure that that doesn't get full of stuff, so that you don't revisit that rot problem again. Okay, Beth. Yeah. Okay, so this is a bank barn um, that I did a uh, looked at for the Preservation Alliance, and this is um, a quick fix to the foundation moving. And this um, never works. But th this is one of the reasons why they shouldn't have shown anybody invention of concrete. But so this is where a concrete wall has been poured on the inside of a Boeing dry laid stone foundation. And the uh, stone is going to keep moving. Um, in this case of this wall, it, it doesn't go below frost. It's just poured down to the, the, the dirt there. And so it's gonna, it's gonna move. And, and this, is just, this just complicates the repair um, scenario of this barn because it's a hassle to remove that concrete. But this is never a good solution. Pouring concrete on the inside of a dry laid foam, uh, stone foundation to try and stall the movement or to be a repair is, is, is just burning your money, okay? Next picture, Beth. Example of powder post beetle. I just want people to see that. Those are powder post beetle trails in the basement of a barn. Um, the way to, to, uh, to solve that problem is A, by spraying with a product called Boracare. Um, uh, it uh, takes care of the powder post beetle. It's not a toxic product for pets or for people. Um, uh, but, but you also, when you do that, you want it. So this gets the environment for powder post beetle is the moisture. So when you have a lot of organic material in your basement, or underneath even a ground level uh, barn, um, which is it's harder to remove, but you wanna remove that stuff. You wanna put in a, a vapor barrier, you wanna put in some stone mm -hmm. under there and, and keep the moisture down. Okay, next slide, Beth. Okay, there's a corner of uh, that barn in Prescott. Um, the uh, trim boards here were nailed on with, with uh, 20 penny spikes. So you knew there was some problem underneath. You couldn't see that from just looking at the trim before it was removed. But uh, you can see the uh, corner post is, is gone. Um, the, uh, the sill going, going off of the corner post, actually in both directions in this situation is gone. And it, it's, uh, it's, it's a, it needs uh, to be restored. So now we're gonna get into the timber frame restoration. Go ahead, Bev. Uh-oh. Rose again. Yeah, hold on. Hmm. Okay. You're good. 
Okay, so that's an example of how not to do it. Okay, that's a, that's a regular lap joint, just a straight lap joint with some, some lag bolts going through it. Um, uh, so when that barn starts moving, you know, that, there's nothing fighting that movement in that, in that lap joint. You know, the bolts are there, but there's nothing, there's nothing that makes that bottom piece besides the bolts, right, an integral, integral piece of the upper part of the post. So we want to do joinery that's going to make that like it's one piece of wood again. Okay, Bev. That's an example of a sill with the same kind of a sill repair with that same kind of joint, but it's a short lap joint. Once again, you can see that the sill on the left is, is, is running uphill away from that other sill. You know, you want a locking lap joint that's going to, that's going to uh, add integrity, uh, you know, keep the structural integrity of the timber frame. Go ahead, Beth. <laughs> and so here's, there's that, once again, the picture of the rear of that barn. You can see the locking lap joints running across the gable on the sill. Um, and then you can see, uh, the bottom of that post on the right of the uh, of the central aisle, um, there's a repair on the bottom. Once again, that's a locking lap joint. So when that's pegged, um, because of the angles, um, not only in the short shoulders but in the long and in the long angle of that of that joint, it maintains the uh, it, it puts back in the structural integrity of that joint and keeps it from moving around. You know, you can add epoxy in that if you want to to glue that and make that even more secure. You know, but you know, you want to make sure that you maintain the trim and make sure that that's not going to have a problem going down the road. Um, go ahead, Bev. There's a different type of locking lap joint that's running up a side wall of a barn. Um, and it's a flat locking lap joint, but those little two inch um, stubs on either end ensure that that has to go together on a straight line and, and maintains that straight line. Because they can't, it won't. This, they won't slide into each other unless it's it's a nice straight line. That's that's um, part of the fact that it's a two foot lap, but it's also because of those little stub tenons on either end. Uh, that product right there of that sill is um, an eight by eight treated hemlock timber. Um, you can see I still put a little piece of plastic wood on the underside of that, you know, to keep that from having problems down the road. If if you weren't using treated hemlock and, and, and um, uh, some sort of treated timber, let's say that was just gonna be a regular pine timber, you know, probably that plastic wood and making sure you're not gonna have a lot of splash up is gonna, is gonna keep that sill lasting a long time, but it's better probably to use a moisture resistant wood, which would be something like white oak, which is getting harder to get or tamarack or, or locust. Okay, Bev. Okay, so well, sometimes the rod isn't that high in the post. This is, this is the, uh, corner post. This is actually of that threshold where you saw me putting in the granite threshold. Um, and if it's the rocks not that high, you know, you want to maintain as much of that post as possible. So I don't want to cut a, cut a lap joint way up high in that timber. So we use a improvised, um, a shorter locking, a uh, shorter lap joint. So you see at the very top of that lap, you can see the bevel on it and that helps lock that in and keep that on a straight line. So, so you know, you could, there's a lot of ways to do it, but you want to make sure that you've got something that's going to keep that from wanting to flex. Okay. Okay, Bev. That's once again, that's an example of that long lap blocking lap joint, you know, high up on a, uh, on a queen post um, where I've reconnected it to the knee brace and, and put it and, and it's pegged. And, and that post really has most of the integrity of the original post. Okay, Bev. I think this, this, this slide just shows where, so this is where a joinery is pulled out. Um, uh, this was that really nice timber frame earlier. Um, you know, we got it back together again, um, but there are places where, you know, the, the, the timbers were in good shape. We got it back together again, but the shoulder of the, um, of the, the, uh, the mortise had broken out due to the movement. You know, we don't want to necessarily have to replace that whole post because it's in, it's in good shape. So we, we cut out a, uh, a segment there and we'll just glue in with epoxy the new piece over that that will maintain the integrity of the uh, side walls of the mortise. Okay, um, but go, go ahead, Beth. Uh, this is, um, so I just want to talk specifically because it was mentioned about when you're going to convert a barn to four season space, okay, um, whether it's going to be used for events or a home. Um, when you're doing that, you're doing that because you're looking, you like the looks of the timber frame. And so you're going to celebrate that timber frame. So you don't want to encapsulate that in in your uh, in your uh, your side walls um, and uh, your roof system, you know, your roof. So you want to be able to see all that. 
So in this situation, we had taken down this small frame and when we put up, uh, put in the new foundations, this was actually a concrete foundation. We make the foundation wider than the original footprint so that if you're gonna use either stress skin panels, which are, um, uh, have uh, uh, polystyrene insulation in them and they'll go on the outside of the frame um, or you're gonna build a stick built frame on the outside, which is what I prefer, um, you have a place for that to come and sit down. Um, the reason I prefer stick built when you're, uh, you know, a two by frame on the outside um, rather than uh, structural panels is because um, when you do that, you can get the high R value that you're looking for um, by spraying a high density foam insulation. You know, you put in a two by six or a two by eight wall. You know, if you have three inches of high density foam, you get an R value of around 33, 34, and you still have plenty of room to run your wiring, you know, uh, plumbing and all those other things in a nice open space. Um, and you don't have a place for ants to make their home. So the problem with structural panels, um, SIPs, is, is, is that uh, most of the time they're polystyrene, which is easy to tunnel in. And carpenter ants love that stuff um, because they're looking for a good place to make a home. They're not eating the wood. Um, and that polystyrene is easy to tunnel in. And it's very hard to get rid of carpenter ants once you have them in, uh, in, in, in SIPs, structural panels, structural integrated panels. So that's why I like the, like this, the regular two by wall on the outside. And you can, use, you can use SIPs on the roof if you want to. Go ahead, Bev. I'm trying. Well, that's all right. The last picture is just that building finished. So if we don't get there, that's okay. Why? Oh, there we go. So that's that building finished. Okay. Um, uh, so, in, in, you know, in, in conclusion, you know, with foundations, drainage is the important thing. Whether you're going to rebuild a, a foundation as a dry laid stone foundation or concrete drainage has to be right. Uh, done right. And what's going to determine um, whether you're going to pick up the barn when you rebuild the foundation or, or fix the foundation is going to be what's damage is done up above. Um, and that's best done by looking at the joinery. And, and you can have a barn where, where it's moved quite a bit, but the joinery can still be fine. You know, I mean, you can have a barn where from one post to the other, it might be two or three inches across the center aisle and that joinery will still be fine up above. And, and you can just secure that barn. And, and even with that movement, as long as the joinery is okay, as soon as you have joinery pulling apart, you know, then you're gonna have to make some decisions on whether you're gonna pick it up or not. Anyways, Bev, we can have questions. <laughs> yeah, there's one question that came in from Wayne um, in the chat. Photo of basement seemed to have 45 degree angles only on one side of the columns. No opposing 45 on the other side of the columns. Can you please explain? Are we talking understand? knee braces maybe? So we're talking, I think we're talking knee braces maybe on, on, that, on that full basement shot of, of Prescott, okay? So the reason there's 45s on one side of that um, was because we were adding that timbering on that side. So it was easy to cut the mortises in that new timbering um, and it was also 16 foot bay on that side, whereas that center aisle bay was 12 feet. So it didn't need that extra support on that side, okay, where the knee brace was coming up, okay? That's why you see that, that 45 going off on that side. Okay, thanks. Wayne, did that answer your question? He's muted. Okay. All right, let's open it up to other questions. Um, a raise of hand, I think, and then I'll call you out, and then you can unmute. Does anybody have? And if if we don't see your image, feel free to write a chat question. No questions? Oh, Jim, Jim Hort, Mort, Norton. Make sure you unmute. Oh yeah, there we go. There we go. Um, in, in looking at most of the barns we have, and again, mostly Connecticut, a few Massachusetts, it seems rare, but much better being a practicing structural engineer to not only have the knee braces at the top, you know, for stability, but the barns that seem to hold up better are the ones that actually have the knee braces at the bottom, sure. from the post to the sill. And it, it seems very rare 
yeah. uh, and yet that doesn't seem like it would have been a big uh, a big effort but if you fix the bottom as you probably know uh, it gives twice the stiffness to the whole barn as without it fixed because the bottom's a pin as soon as you put the triangle in it fixes it right uh, is, is there any reason that they just never bothered or no the re the re the reason is putting the frame together and standing it up right so okay. so in a in a um in a early barn where you've got um uh the uh, english meeting joint you know uh it's going to be mostly sidewalls and, and and that are put up you know um where it's a later barn um it's going to be you know a section across the gable end that's going to be a bent that's going to be stood up and it's in order to get that knee brace, you can stand it up into a knee brace, right? But if you want a knee brace on the other side, right, you've got to go off perpendicular and then bring it back to right get back. That, that, that tenon to go into the mortise, right? So a lot of times you didn't see that because it was just easier to stand that barn up. So it is much more work. That knee brace because the rest of them all put in at green level, you yeah. know? But, that, so, but you're right about that. I mean, if you look at um, that, uh, frame that I said was a really nice frame. One of the reasons that was there was one really nice frame was because of knee bracing all over the place, up and down, you know, and that barn had moved a lot and it, 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 it suffered a lot of movement in its foundation because of all that knee bracing. We've done some retrofitting of a barn, you know, when you retrofit, you just go in and you can put a whole new knee brace in. Um, even I have to splice it to get it in, but it adds a lot of stability. As long as I have a good sill, and right. it's always nice to anchor the sill at the base right. of the knee brace. That's right. So you, you could add that knee bracing by doing a little dovetail tenon at the bottom, right? Yeah. And, and do it as a lat from the outside. Or you can do a long tenon and slide that knee brace into it and then plug the backside of that, of a long mortise, and then plug the backside of the mortise. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it seems to have helped a, a oh, lot sure. of It will definitely yeah. help. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay, Ian and Lori asked, where did you say the knee braces were in early English barns? In early English barns, knee braces. Well, they would add, they, I mean, they would add knee braces just like the, like the, uh, the Yankee barns, but a lot of your early English barns were more, had usually more knee braces on the side walls and, and, and uh, but they would have been in the same places, you know, if that's the question. I think that is. Okay. Is that your question, Lori? Yeah. Okay. I see another All question. right, Tom. Um, quick question. Uh, with the barn that is not leaning from side to side, but leaning from gable to gable, yeah, beginning sure. to tip yeah. that way, how, uh, with none of the knee uh, uh, joinery or the uh, joists uh, separating, how would you address that? Okay, okay. So, so that, that's, a, that's an example of a bank barn having problems as well most of the time. I don't know if it's a full basement barn or not, but a lot of times for it to get that lean in it, it's got to be the foundation moving it to push it to do that. Um, you, you, I mean, I, I would be, if it's leaning like that, I would be looking a little bit at, um, one, how it was built, but also did they move the uh, hayloft um, up higher? You know, uh, a lot of times, um, you know, when they started doing dairy and stuff like that, the hayloft would have been lower down and they didn't like it that low. So they cut off the tenons, right? And so it looks like the frame may be intricately connected going down the length of the barn, but they might have cut all those tenons off and just moved the pieces up, which allows the movement to, ha to have more damage, right? Um, you can bring those back together again. Uh, I mean, you can get them back more plumb, but if the, by basically, you have to remove a lot of stuff first, but you can attach a, you know, a strap and a, and a come along way up at the top of the gable and you go all the way back down an angle down to the bottom of the, of the queen post on the other side of the center aisle and you just slowly crank it back, you know. Um, but for, in order to do that, you have to remove stuff that was added after it had the movement, right? And you have to make sure that um, uh, that you have you can can do that against the mortise and tenons. You know, that's why I say look at those look at those timbers that are that are establishing the hayloft. My bet is you'll probably find that they cut those off and pick them up. 
you know. They did. There are lots of uh, pieces missing. You can see yeah. the square holes. Right, right. And, and so if you look at that also, if you see some big nails in the side of those timbers, then you know they cut those tenons and they re-nailed them or they did something. If they got a slot, if they got a block of wood underneath the timber, you know, that's, they, they picked it up and, and slid, it, slid it and did that. So once again, so when they start, when farmers start messing and moving things around and, and then movement happens, the damage gets telegraphed worse because the structural integrity of the timber frame has been compromised, okay? Okay, maybe one more question and then some of the chat questions I will address in my wrap up. Does anybody have another question though that they wanna ask before we do our wrap up? Oh, John. You're muted, John. Okay. okay. Um, in general, how much deflection in a, a principal rafter would be acceptable before you decide it was failed? Like my, my old English barn, which is about two miles from you, Ian, um, it, the, the outer wall that's queen post have rotted at the bottom, you know, the outer, just all the standard things you're talking about. The rafter is crowned like this and you know the the there's there's purlins pushing up and there's about six inches of hump and now would you consider that to have stressed to the point where it wouldn't be worth unstressing it well the stress i think in that situation if it's humped up is caused by the outside wall sinking right right, right. and so and so the inner wall is the the center post is still still uh, where it was right, right. So, so in that situation, I, I would, it, w w if, if the sills are bad and you're repairing those sills, I would, I would get that jacked up and, and, and take that, it'll take that hump out. Okay. okay. So, and so the timber would still be salvageable, you'd think. Oh, so, yeah, sure. I mean, that all depends on what the roof is doing on, uh, you know, right. above that, you know, I mean, if, if the roof is in big, good, good shape, so if you're looking at those boards and you don't see any white, then yeah, that's okay. Yeah, there's some of that, but I, I'm going to try to address it. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate that. Sure. Okay, so I think we need to wrap up. This probably could go on all night, but uh, we were trying to keep it close to an hour. So I want to thank you all for joining. Thank you so much, Ian. Ian's just a wealth of knowledge about barns. Um, some of you has, have asked about virtual assessments or other assessments. The Preservation Alliance, besides Ian's virtual assessments, which I'm not sure how many more of those he's doing because he's done so many. We do have a barn assessment grant program. Uh, we have a barn page on our website. I encourage you to read through that. It talks about our assessment grant program where we offer small matching grants to have a contractor like Ian. We have a big long list of contractors who will come out to your barn, do an assessment, do write up a report prioritizing the needs and giving you some rough cost estimates. That is a uh, matching grant program where the grant is a full 500, you contribute 100 towards that match. You do have to apply for it. So all that information's on our website. The other really important and key piece of information on that website is the barn tax incentive program for New Hampshire um, agricultural structures. Um, it in encourages people to invest in their barns without having their property taxes go up on the barn itself. So there's a really good information packet about that on the website. Um, right now we have over 100 towns participating in the program with over, I think it's 603 agricultural structures in the program um, that are protected by, it's a 10 year preservation easement in exchange for you committing to maintain your barn. The New Hampshire Preservation Alliance does not administer that program. That application would go to your towns. We just help promote it. But I also speak with a lot of town administrators. So if you have any questions about the application that gets submitted to your town, I'd be happy to help you with that. And even if your town is one of the towns participating. Um, it does not have to be voted on by a town-wide vote to, to participate. If you want to apply, the select board um, or town council has to review your application, then it's up to them to decide whether or not they want to support it. Okay. Um, so we do have this great barn resource page on our website, nhpreservation.org, and there's all kinds of good stuff on there. Uh, my email address is on there as well. Any barn related questions, I run the barn program at the Alliance, so happy to help. 
Um, always love seeing photographs of barns, problem barns, beautiful pictures, whatever, send them to me. We love that. Um, if you are interested in having a contractor come out to your barn um, and you're not interested in the grant program, I have a big long list of barn contractors. We have a great network in New Hampshire. We're very fortunate um, of contractors all over the state who help and are very supportive of the historic barns in New Hampshire and beyond. They do go beyond. Um, a couple of program notes I wanted to mention. Tomorrow evening, uh, the National Barn Alliance is hosting our very own John Porter. John Porter is the author of the newly revised Preserving Old Barns. He wrote the original book, oh, 15 years ago or so, and then we just revised it, expanded version of it. Um, so he's going to be featured on the National Barn Alliance Zoom call tomorrow evening. That information's on our website. They actually said that you had to register by Sunday, and I sent them an email today asking if we could still register. They didn't get back to me, so I'm not sure about registration, uh, but I would send them an email anyway if you're interested, and that's tomorrow at six o'clock. And then if you can't make tomorrow, John's actually doing another one locally, and I forget which historical society, but it's a Zoom one on October 5th. And he does this through the Human New Hampshire Humanities, the Humanities to Go. So he has quite a few of these set up over the next few months, and we have them all listed on our website. So you can find out about those through us. Um, and there's other, we have a whole calendar of events related to preservation uh, programs and functions and things. So feel free to check that out as well. Um, so thank you all for coming. There's one more chat. Let me just make sure I get to this. Just want to say we got an NHPA grant for the assessment of our barn and it had excellent advice. NHPA gets our cheers. Okay, thank you, Lori. Um, so anyway, thank you so much for joining today. Um, we greatly appreciate your membership and encourage you to join if you haven't already. Um, eight, over 80% 80 of our funding does come from membership dollars. So um, it's very important to our organization. So thank you so much, Ian, and no thank problem. you all for participating. And please stay connected with us and be safe. Take care, everybody. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye.